Turkey and Syria. February 6, 2023. More than 45,000 lives lost. Thousands of pictures and videos showing crumbling buildings and horrified running crowds. Japan, March 11, 2011. Around 20,000 victims. Strong tremors causing a nuclear emergency at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and radiation leaks. Haiti, January 1st, 2010. Hundreds of thousands of victims. A collapsed country that still can't fully recover from the consequences of this horrific event. Sumatra, December 26, 2004. Right after Christmas one of the deadliest natural disasters in recorded history. What's going on with the Earth? Is it falling apart, taking us with her? It definitely feels like that, but it's not as easy as it seems. There's no way to predict this force. There's no way to fight it. But it's possible to learn to live with it and hope for the mercy of nature. In this video, you'll learn more about one of the most disastrous forces on our planet that terrified humanity for centuries. What exactly causes earthquakes? How did one scientist foresee the earthquake in Syria and Turkey? And why did everybody ignore his predictions? Are we able to see where the next earthquakes are going to happen? And finally, how exactly can we protect ourselves? Let's unravel together the secrets of the violent shaking. We will show you the rare footage of these horrifying moments, tell you everything about the deadliest natural disasters that happened in the last few years, and even share with you some incredible photos of a volcanic eruption that cost one brave man his life. The Nature of Earthquakes – Why the World Cracks Open February 3rd, 2023. A Dutch researcher specializing in seismic activity tweets about the high possibility of earthquakes that sooner or later will hit Turkey and Syria. No one paid attention to it. No one took this tweet seriously. Just three days later, humanity experienced one of the deadliest natural disasters of the 21st century. On February 6th, an extremely strong earthquake with a magnitude of 7.8 hit the southeastern region of Turkey and the northwestern part of Syria. More than 570 aftershocks were recorded within the next 24 hours and around 10,000 in the three weeks afterward. The tremors were so powerful that they were felt in many other countries. Iraq, Israel, Jordan, Lebanon, Greece, Cyprus, Georgia, and Armenia. A thousand videos with crumbling buildings flooded the internet in seconds. More than 45,000 people died. More than 108,000 were injured. Millions lost their homes. The economic damage is estimated at $84 billion which is roughly 10% of Turkey's economy in 2022. This tragedy raised many questions for the whole world, but especially for those who currently live near the earthquake area. Why did such a disastrous earthquake occur in this location? What exactly caused it? Could anyone predict it? And is it possible to lower such disastrous consequences? To answer those questions, we should first learn more about the nature of this disaster. First, let's see how earthquakes are measured. For that, scientists use a seismometer. It detects and records the vibrations or seismic waves produced by the movement of the Earth's crust. There are several scales to measure earthquakes, but the most common is the Richter scale which assigns a numerical value to the earthquake's magnitude. The magnitude is calculated based on the amplitude of the seismic waves recorded by the seismometer. The Richter scale is a logarithmic, which means that each increase in one point corresponds to a tenfold increase in the amplitude of the seismic waves. For example, 
an earthquake with a magnitude of 7.0 on the Richter scale would produce seismic waves that are 10 times larger than those with a magnitude of 6.0. Earthquakes with a magnitude of less than 3.5 are rarely felt, but are recorded on seismographs. The tremors with a magnitude from 3.5 and up to 5.4 can be felt, but usually there are no significant consequences. Major earthquakes responsible for massive destruction have a magnitude of 7.0 and higher. Now, let's see what exactly is causing them and what happens under the ground. There is a lot of movement going on just under our feet. Most of it we do not even feel. But let's dig deeper to understand the whole picture. Imagine a whole apple. The skin is the thinnest part of it. At the same time, it's very tough. Now the crust is just like the apple skin, but for the earth. It is only about 6 to 40 kilometers thick, which is only 0.4% of the Earth's radius. However, unlike the apple skin, it's not just a single continuous layer. It's broken up into pieces called tectonic plates. There are 15 major tectonic plates along with many smaller ones. They are made up of both the continental crust, which forms the continents, and the oceanic crust, which shapes the floor of the oceans. The thing is, those plates are not just chilling there. They are constantly moving by the connective flow of material in the Earth's mantle. Here is how it happens. The heat from the Earth's core drives this flow. So hotter and less dense material rises, while cooler and denser material sinks. This process creates a circular motion, and the tectonic plates go along with it. The movement is also influenced by other factors, like the distribution of mass on the Earth's surface, the pull of gravity, and the frictional forces along plate boundaries. In normal conditions, this motion is very, very slow. On average, plates are moving approximately 1.5 centimeters per year. In comparison, human toenails grow at almost the same rate. Of course, that doesn't seem like much. What's the harm in some 1.5 centimeter movement in a year, right? But with time, it all adds up. For example, Europe and Africa move away from North and South America at about 4 centimeters per year. That's how in the past 150 million years, the Atlantic Ocean has opened to a width of 6,000 kilometers. Also, some plates are moving faster, building up a lot of energy in the plate boundaries. They are responsible for the worst natural disasters. Here's what happens. The plates can move towards, away from, or slide past one another. The interactions between them at their boundaries drive many geological processes, including earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. There are three main types of plate boundaries, divergent, convergent, and transform. Two tectonic plates with divergent boundaries are moving away from each other. As plates drift apart, magma from the mantle rises to fill the gap and solidifies to form a new crust. Those boundaries are typically found along the ocean floor. Earthquakes at divergent boundaries are usually shallow and have low magnitudes. However, they can still be measured by seismologists. The Mid-Atlantic Ridge is a divergent boundary that runs down the center of the Atlantic Ocean. It is the longest mountain range in the world. It was created by the separation of the North American plate and the Eurasian plate. With transform boundaries, two tectonic plates slide past each other horizontally. Those boundaries do not create or destroy crust, but they can offset it, resulting in the formation of ridges or valleys. The San Andreas Fault in California is a transform boundary where the Pacific and North American plates are sliding past each other. 
The movement along this boundary is responsible for the frequent earthquakes in the region. Now what about convergent boundaries? In this case, two tectonic plates move toward each other and collide. This boundary is responsible for the strongest tremors. The collision and subduction of tectonic plates create large amounts of energy and stress which results in disasters with magnitudes of 7.0 or higher. Now the tremors are caused by faults, which are cracks in the Earth's crust occurred due to movement. Again, there are three types of them. Normal faults occur when tensional forces pull the Earth's crust apart, causing the rock on one side of the fault to move downward relative to the other side. Normal faults are typically found at divergent plate boundaries, where tectonic plates move away from each other. Reverse faults are found at convergent plate boundaries, where tectonic plates move toward each other and collide. In this case, compressional forces push the Earth's crust together, causing the rock on one side of the fault to move upward relative to the other side. Strike-slip faults occur at transform plate boundaries, where tectonic plates slide past each other in opposite directions. When the rocks along the fault break and slide past each other, disastrous earthquakes occur. But is the movement of the plates the only thing that can cause earthquakes? Mainly, but some other factors can also trigger them. First, volcanic activity. When magma rises through the Earth's crust, it creates pressure and tension in the rocks around it. Eruptions also create seismic activity due to the release of gases and pressure. Additionally, some human activities can be responsible for earthquakes, particularly hydraulic fracturing, also called fracking. This process involves injecting pressurized water and chemicals into the ground to release oil and gas reserves. The pressure and vibration caused by this procedure can create induced earthquakes. Generally, they are not as powerful as natural earthquakes, but still can pose a risk to people and infrastructure. Now that we know how earthquakes happen, let's go back for a moment to the recent tragic events in Turkey and Syria and see what exactly caused them and how they were predicted. So, the earthquake struck along the East Anatolian Fault Zone, a region near the junction of the Anatolian, Arabian, and African plates. The main cause was a strike-slip movement. As we already mentioned, in this case, tectonic plates slide past each other in opposite directions. There wasn't a lot of seismic activity in the very recent past. However, a lot of stress was building up over time in this area. It wasn't a question if the earthquake is going to strike. The only question was when it was going to happen. A lot of seismologists were saying that a powerful earthquake will eventually strike this region. And here is the most mystic part of this story. The earthquake was actually predicted by Dutch researcher Frank Hugerbeets. The scientist works for the Solar System Geometry Survey, a research institute that monitors the geometry of celestial bodies in relation to seismic activities. Hugerbeets predicted that a 7.5 magnitude earthquake would occur in the region of South Central Turkey, Jordan, Syria, and Lebanon, particularly on February 3rd. He tweeted, Sooner or later, there will be a 7.5 magnitude earthquake in this region, South Central Turkey, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon. His predictions did come true in just three days. Despite this, some people on Twitter labeled him a pseudoscientist and questioned his previous predictions. But then another strange thing happened. Hugerbeets retweeted a post by his research agency, SSGEOS, shortly after the earthquake, predicting the possibility of a new big trembler. The second earthquake, measuring 7.6 on the Richter scale, struck Turkey just about three hours after the tweet. How is this possible? 
Did Frank come up with an accurate method for earthquake prediction? That's what you may think in the first place. However, many scientists claim that Frank's predictions are not something that can be totally reliable. While commenting on his work, Susan Huff of the U.S. Geological Survey insisted that no scientist has ever predicted a major earthquake. According to her, the direct forecast for the earthquakes in Turkey and Syria was just a coincidence. And the truth is, many predictions of Frank didn't come true in the past. Weeks later, after the tragic events in Turkey and Syria, the seismologist claimed that there is going to be another strong earthquake around the 3rd or 4th or 6th or 7th of March. According to him, the affected area could stretch for thousands of kilometers, from the Kamchatka Peninsula and the Kuril Islands all the way to the Philippines and Indonesia. The head of the Kamchatka branch of the geophysical research of the Russian Academy of Sciences, Danila Chebrov, questioned Hooger Beat's predictions and described him as an amateur. His main concern is the fact that Hooger Beats makes his forecasts based on the motions of celestial bodies. As the researcher mentioned, the connection between the motion of planets in the solar system and seismic activity on Earth is weak, and it is problematic to use it as a main prognostic tool. It's hard to claim now if the Turkey earthquake prediction was really just a coincidence. However, the recent prognosis of another strong earthquake didn't come true, yet. Should we be ready for another disaster? Only time will tell. At this point, it seems that Hooger Beat's predictions were more of a coincidence. But for now, we can learn more about the earthquakes that happened in the recent past and see what we can do to lower their consequences. Let's dive deeper into the history of the deadliest earthquakes that happened in the last 120 years. For example, there was another powerful earthquake that happened in Turkey just a few decades ago. In 1999, a very strong earthquake with a magnitude of 7.4 hit the Marmara region, which included the cities of Izmit and Istanbul. It was caused by the strike-slip movement of the North Anatolian Fault on the northern edge of the country. Previously, it already triggered extremely powerful natural disasters, such as the Erzincan earthquake in 1939, the Nixar-Urba earthquake in 1942, and the Varto earthquake in 1966. The tremors were also felt in Greece, Bulgaria, and Romania. Back then, this tragic event took the lives of more than 17,000 people. More than 43,000 were injured and around 100,000 left homeless. Many structures and buildings were completely destroyed. Following the 2023 earthquake, many researchers and journalists pointed out that the lessons of the disastrous 1999 event were not learned. The buildings in the affected regions were not built according to safety codes. Hakan Suleiman, a researcher in the Department of Earthquake Engineering at Istanbul's Bogazici University mentioned that proper enforcement of safety codes would have meant a completely different picture now. Sadly, in many risky regions, the buildings are not built accordingly, and sometimes the tremors are so strong that even the strongest structures collapse. Let's see what other strong earthquakes happened in the 20th and 21st centuries. December 28, 1908, Messina, Italy. Imagine a beautiful Italian city in the northeast of Sicily. It was just another sunny morning. Suddenly, the ground started to shake violently, sending shockwaves through the city and the surrounding areas. A devastating earthquake of 7.1 magnitude lasted for over 30 seconds. It was felt even in Rome, which is over 400 kilometers from Messina. The catastrophe was caused by the strike-slip movement of the Eurasian and African plates along the boundary known as the Calabrian Arc. 
The impact of the event was catastrophic. The entire city was completely destroyed. But a few minutes later, the earthquake triggered another disaster. Waves up to 12 meters high swept over the nearest coastal towns, dragging people, homes, and boats out to sea. 75,000 people died. Around 1,000 people lost their lives as a direct result of the tsunami. Many more were injured or left homeless. 15 years later, September 1st, 1923, Kanto, Japan. The tragic event occurred due to the movement of the Earth's crust along the Sagami Trough, a subduction zone where the Pacific Plate is forced beneath the Eurasian Plate. A 7.9 magnitude earthquake was followed by a series of powerful aftershocks that continued for days. It had a profound impact on the city of Tokyo, which was known back then as Edo, was not the only tragedy. The tremors triggered massive fires fueled by the destruction of gas and power lines. They swept through Tokyo and surrounding areas. The fires raged for days, burning down entire neighborhoods, leaving earthquake survivors without food, water, or shelter. Due to the lack of official records, it's impossible to learn the exact number of casualties. It is believed that around 100,000 people died in this tragic event. October 5, 1948, Ashgabat, Turkmenistan. The Ashgabat earthquake was a result of the collision between the Eurasian and Arabian plates, leading to the rupture of the Ashgabat Fault. The earthquake had a magnitude of 7.3. It was centered in Ashgabat, the capital city of Turkmenistan, and was felt throughout the region. The earthquake destroyed most of the buildings, leaving the city in ruins. The shaking was felt in Uzbekistan and Afghanistan. The Dara Gaz region in Iran also experienced damage and casualties. A horrifying event indeed. But what happened next made everything worse. The Soviet government imposed censorship on the news of the Ashgabat earthquake, resulting in limited coverage of the disaster in the media. Many historians believe that the government's decision to suppress information about the scale of this tragic event had the worst consequences. As a result, the world didn't provide sufficient help to Turkmenistan. Many victims were put in mass graves. Most of them were not identified. Another consequence of the lack of information was an inaccurate death toll. The fact that around 50,000 people survived implies that the death toll may have been between 80,000 and 100,000, which is approximately two-thirds of the population of Ashgabat. Chimbote, Peru, May 31st. 1970. This is the most catastrophic earthquake in the history of Peru. It was caused by the collision of the South American and Nazca tectonic plates along the Andean mountain range. The earthquake had a magnitude of 7.9. Its epicenter was located near Chimbote, a port city in northern Peru. Around 90% of the buildings there were destroyed. The tremors also caused a deadly tsunami that ruined coastal towns and villages. Mount Huascaran's northern wall destabilized, resulting in a massive avalanche of rock, ice, and snow. It buried the nearby towns of Yungay and Rarahirka. The earthquake was felt throughout the country. It was so strong that it caused buildings to sway in Lima, located over 300 kilometers away from the epicenter. It was also felt in Ecuador, Brazil, and Colombia. The disaster damaged key infrastructure, including the Pan American Highway. That hindered the arrival of much needed humanitarian aid. The official number of casualties was reported as 70,000. 
The earthquake left hundreds of thousands of people homeless. Many were forced to live in shelters. Following the tragedy, the Peruvian government had forbidden excavation in the area where the town of Yungay was buried. It was declared as a national cemetery. Later on, in 2000, May 31st was declared in the country as Natural Disaster Education and Reflection Day. July 28, 1976, Tangshan, China. This is the deadliest earthquake in the history of China. It was caused by the collision of the Eurasian and Pacific tectonic plates. The epicenter was located in Tangshan, a city with a population of around 1 million people. The earthquake had a magnitude of 7.6 on the Richter scale and was felt over a large area, including Beijing, located around 140 kilometers from Tangshan. In just a few minutes, around 80% of the buildings of Tangshan were completely destroyed, as well as the railway and highway bridges. The official death toll was reported as 242,000, with over 164,000 people injured. The earthquake also left around 1 million people homeless. Strong aftershocks continued until August 1976. December 7, 1988, Spitak, Armenia. This disastrous earthquake was caused by the collision of the Arabian and Eurasian tectonic plates. It had a magnitude of 6.9 and lasted for around 40 seconds. The epicenter was located near the town of Spitak, around 75 kilometers northwest of the Armenian capital, Yerevan. The earthquake was felt in many countries, including Azerbaijan, Georgia, Iran, and Turkey. The official death toll was reported as 25,000, with over 19,000 people injured. However, some estimates suggest that the actual death toll could be as high as 50,000. The earthquake left around 500,000 people homeless. The town of Spitak suffered the most from the earthquake. Almost all the buildings were completely destroyed. Giumri and Vanadzor, the second and third biggest cities of Armenia respectively, also were highly damaged. The earthquake was felt in industrial areas with chemical plants and electrical substations. Due to public concerns, the authorities even closed the Metzamor nuclear power plant for six years. Right after the earthquake, Armenia received tremendous support and aid from the international community. Back then, the country was part of the Soviet Union. Despite the tensions of the Cold War, Mikhail Gorbachev formally asked the United States for humanitarian help within a few days of the earthquake. It was the first request like this since the late 1940s. The United States government sent humanitarian aid to the country, which included medical supplies, food, and clothing as well as a team of disaster response experts. In general, more than 113 countries helped Armenia to overcome the consequences of this tragic event. December 26, 2004, Sumatra, Indonesia. The Indian Ocean earthquake was one of the deadliest in recorded history. It had a magnitude of 9.3 on the Richter scale and was caused by the rupture of the boundary between the Burma and the Indian plates. Their movement triggered a massive undersea earthquake, which caused a series of devastating tsunamis. The energy released by the earthquake was equivalent to 23,000 Hiroshima-type atomic bombs. The tsunami waves reached as high as 30 meters in some places, extensively damaging the coastal communities across the Indian Ocean. The earthquake and resulting tsunami affected over 14 countries, with Indonesia, Sri Lanka, and India experiencing the most significant damage. This natural disaster killed over 230,000 people and displaced millions. The earthquake was so powerful that it caused the entire planet to vibrate. 
the seismic waves were even detected in Antarctica. The whole planet changed forever after this earthquake and tsunami. Literally, the Earth's axis shifted by about an inch, which slightly changed the length of a day. May 12, 2008, Sichuan, China. The earthquake had a magnitude of 7.9. It was caused by the rupture of a thrust fault along the Longmenshin fault zone. Tremors lasted for around two minutes. People felt it in Vietnam, Thailand, Russia, India, Bangladesh, Mongolia, Nepal, and Pakistan. The Sichuan earthquake was the deadliest natural disaster for China since the 1976 Tangshan earthquake. Over 69,000 people were killed, and more than 18,000 were missing and presumed dead more than 15 million people were displaced. The natural disaster caused the largest number of geohazards ever recorded, including about 200,000 landslides and more than 800 quick lakes. January 12, 2010, Haiti. This catastrophe had a magnitude of 7.0 and was caused by the movement of the Enriquillo Plantain Garden fault system. According to the information from the Haiti government, 250,000 residences and 30,000 commercial buildings had collapsed or were severely damaged. The earthquake killed over 230,000 people and injured more than 300,000. It left more than 1.5 million people homeless. The morgues in Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti, were overwhelmed with tens of thousands of bodies that had to be buried in mass graves. Many countries sent humanitarian aid and raised funds for Haiti. The most watched telethon in history aired on January 22nd, called Hope for Haiti Now, and raised around $58 million by the next day. However, Haiti still is going through challenging times today, over a decade after the devastating event. When the earthquake struck, the country was already going through instability. It exacerbated the existing humanitarian crisis. This is something that today faces Syria. Already destroyed due to the crisis and war, the country is now going through another challenge because of the recent powerful earthquake. Before it, many experts already claimed that Syria will need decades to recover. After this natural disaster, the situation in the country got worse. This is yet another tragic reminder that the power of nature can strike us when we expect it the least. In times like this, it's important to put our differences aside, unite, and share knowledge. And as we talk about seismic activity and earthquakes, we should mention another symbol of the immersive power of nature, volcano. Truly the most fascinating, yet scary phenomenon. As with earthquakes, their eruptions are happening unexpectedly and cause a lot of destruction on their way. And seismic activity can play a role in that. But what exactly happens when the volcanoes explode? And how are volcanic activity and earthquakes related? Well, first, let's see what volcanoes are and how they appear on the Earth's surface. Volcanoes form at the boundaries of tectonic plates. Their movement can create a weakness in the Earth's crust. That allows magma under the crust to rise and break out on the surface. Volcanic eruptions happen when pressure builds up inside the magma chamber. When it reaches the surface, it comes out explosively and releases a lot of hot ash, gas, and lava. Aside from tectonic activity, a volcanic explosion can be triggered by changes in pressure and magma composition. Additionally, the presence of groundwater can be responsible for eruptions. This happens when the water turns to steam while contacting hot magma, causing an increase in pressure. 
Now, how are earthquakes and volcanic eruptions related? First, both volcanic activity and earthquakes occur on the boundaries of tectonic plates. Second, volcanic eruptions can be triggered by earthquakes. Strong tremors fracture in the Earth's crust, allowing magma to rise to the surface and erupt. In some cases, earthquakes can also cause changes in the pressure within the magma chamber, which also leads to an explosion. As with earthquakes, it's difficult to predict the timing of volcanic eruptions. Some of the formations may be dormant for hundreds or thousands of years, and then suddenly explode. Others erupt regularly and have a more predictable pattern. Volcanic activity has a significant impact on the environment and the people who live nearby. They cause air pollution, disrupt transportation, damage crops and infrastructure. The most explosive eruptions destroy whole cities and take the lives of thousands of people. Sometimes, volcanic eruptions trigger seismic waves that can be detected by seismometers. Those waves provide valuable information about the explosion and help us understand the processes that are taking place deep within the volcano. Photos of the eruptions are also a valuable source of information for researchers who study volcanic activity. In that sense, the history of Robert Langsburg who died while taking pictures of Mount St. Helens in Washington State, is truly remarkable. Robert was a talented photographer and passionate nature enthusiast. On May 17, 1980, he camped near the volcano and wrote in his journal the following phrase, feels right on the verge of something. His gut feeling didn't lie. The next day, on May 18, he saw the imminent volcanic explosion in the distance. Sadly, it was too close. He knew that he could not escape it in time to save his own life. However, instead of panicking, he took photographs until the very last moment. Then he took the film out of his camera, placed it in a case, and put it in his backpack. Making his final sacrifice, he laid his body down on his backpack. He was found 17 days later. Robert was buried in ash, but his film was intact. His incredible photos were featured in the January issue of National Geographic in 1981. His last work was also significant for scientists. They used the photos to study the sequence of events leading up to the eruption the dynamics of the ash cloud, and the effects of this disastrous volcanic activity on the surrounding landscape. Overall, images helped researchers better understand the dynamics of volcanic eruptions and their impacts on the environment. During the next few decades, scientists also developed new technologies to better understand the behavior of volcanoes. They use a combination of monitoring techniques, such as seismology, gas monitoring, and satellite imaging to track volcanic activity, provide insight into the movement of magma within the volcano, and understand when it's likely going to explode. But what about the ways to predict where the next earthquakes are going to happen? Is there any technology for that? Well, not exactly, yet. However, as we know the location of the tectonic plate boundaries, we can tell where the earthquakes are most likely going to happen. The most earthquake-prone areas are located along the edges of tectonic plates. These areas include the Ring of Fire, which stretches from New Zealand to Japan to the west coast of the Americas and Himalayan, Mediterranean, and Caribbean regions. Japan is located in the Ring of Fire. It's one of the most earthquake-prone countries as it stands right at the intersection of several major tectonic plates. Indonesia, the Philippines, and New Zealand are also at high risk. The Himalayan region is another area with a lot of earthquakes going on. 
It is located at the boundary between the Indian and Eurasian tectonic plates. That's why Nepal, India, and China constantly experience strong earthquakes. The Mediterranean region is also at risk. Here, Italy, Greece, and Turkey experience frequent seismic activity. In fact, the ancient city of Istanbul is located on a major fault line. Many scientists claim that it is at risk for a large earthquake in the near future. Similarly, the Caribbean region is an earthquake zone due to its location along the boundary between the North American and Caribbean tectonic plates. Here, Haiti and the Dominican Republic have experienced devastating earthquakes in the past. Those are the riskiest zones. However, earthquakes can occur in unexpected places too. All regions must remain prepared for seismic activity, regardless of their history. Predicting exactly where and when earthquakes will happen is not possible, but identifying high-risk areas can help to be prepared. And here's a great example. Four tectonic plates converge in the territory of this country. 10% of active volcanoes are located here. Two to three earthquakes happen here every day. Still, we don't hear about their consequences in the media. Why? It's simple, actually. There are no major consequences. The people and the government do everything to decrease the impact of earthquakes that are happening here all the time. That country is Japan and it always had the best level of earthquake preparedness. Those measures were even more improved after one of the strongest natural disasters in modern history, the 2011 Tohoku earthquake and tsunami with a 1.9 magnitude that killed over 200,000 people. Japan's strategy is highly effective. First, the government established construction standards Buildings here are required to meet strict seismic safety standards. The skyscrapers here are designed to move with the quake. One of the best Japanese creations is the flying house equipped with an air cushion capable to rise a few centimeters above the ground in the event of earthquakes. It stays like this until the end of the tremors. Seems like something fantastic, huh? but it's just an advanced technology. The house has a sensor that detects the activity and sends a signal to activate the air compressor. After that, it fills the air within seconds. When the earthquake stops, the building sits on a special frame around the perimeter of the foundation. Another measure is the early warning system. The Japanese Meteorological Agency detects the initial seismic waves of an earthquake and sends out alerts to regions that are likely to be affected. All Japanese mobile phones are equipped with an earthquake warning system that triggers around 5 to 10 seconds before the earthquake, giving time to quickly seek protection if necessary. The government has also invested in research and education. Japan has some of the world's leading researchers who are constantly studying earthquakes and developing new ways to understand and predict them. Additionally, the country has a strong culture of disaster preparedness and community resilience. People here are taught from a young age about the importance of earthquake preparedness. The neighborhoods and workplaces have disaster response plans in place, and people regularly participate in earthquake drills. Japan's experience is a strong example of how people are living in peace with nature's power. And while we cannot control when or where earthquakes will strike next, we can definitely learn from the experiences of others and take steps to prepare ourselves and our communities. Being prepared doesn't mean being scared. It's about being informed and proactive. As we continue to study these events and gather more data, there is a possibility that we may one day be able to predict earthquakes with greater accuracy. 
As of now, we can follow the example of Japan and invest more in early warning systems, emergency response plans, community education, and research. And while the future may hold many unknowns, one thing is certain. By working together, sharing knowledge, and supporting one another, we can create a safer and more resilient world.